Welcome everybody to this year's uh, public policy lecture hosted by the Department of Politics and International Studies in collaboration with the, with the Bennett Institute for Public Policy at the University of Cambridge. I am Cristina Peñasco, Director of the MPhil in Public Policy at the University of Cambridge and on behalf of all of us in policy in the Department of Politics and International Studies and in the Bennett Institute for Public Policy, uh, I would like to thank you all for sharing this event uh, with us. You might actually be wondering why we have organized this event as a meeting and not as a webinar. And it's precisely because we want to celebrate the public policy community we are all together. And the Department of Politics and International Studies and the Bennett Institute for Public Policy, which was founded in 2018, are two of the places in the University of Cambridge in which the debates about public policy and how to do better policy are more alive. But we know that we are not alone in this. You are all part of this community. And today is the day in the year in which we highlight the power of multidisciplinary research, collaboration, and cooperation. We also want to take this opportunity to introduce all you to the uh, current cohort of the MPhil in public policy among the audience today, uh, which is formed by an exceptional group of young and promising postgraduate students and professionals coming from all over the world. This event is actually part and also represent our vision on education and how we can see the development of a new generation of reflexive and critical policy, policy leaders. Uh, said that, today we will have the unique opportunity to hear Professor Dan Ottolin Laser, newly appointed CEO of UK Research and Innovation, the non departmental public body sponsored by the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy that is responsible for supporting research and knowledge exchange at higher education institutions in England and the UK Innovation Agency. Uh, but first, let me uh, few, uh, note a few things. This event will be recorded, it's been recorded, uh, but attendees cannot be seen or heard. The recording will be posted on the Bennett Institute uh, channel shortly after. Later on, after the, the lecture, there will be a question and answer section where you will be able to direct your questions to Professor Laser. To do this, as we would like to have an experience as close as possible to the one that we used to have face to face, you will see that at the bottom of your screen, there is a chat window function. We encourage you to write your name and organization if relevant there. And you have, uh, when you have a question, and I will ask you to unmute yourself during the Q&A section so you can ask directly uh, your question to Professor Laser. Feel free to write your name for a question uh, at any time during, during the event. We also have our social network channels, so feel free to tweet using the various Twitter handles that we'll post on the chat uh, now. And now, without further delay, I will pass to uh, I will pass over to Professor Michael Kenny, inaugural director of the Bennett Institute for Public Policy, who will introduce Professor Dame Ottolin Laser. Thank you, everybody. Mike. Thank you, Christina. Um, as Christina says, I'm I'm Mike Kenny, director of the Bennett Institute for Public Policy here at Cambridge, and I also teach on the MPhil program with Christina. Um, I'm really delighted to introduce our speaker this evening. Professor so Dame Otteline Leiser, and I was even more delighted when she accepted my invitation to uh, speak at this event a few months ago. Um, I just, my hope then was that it might be possible to do this in person, um, but that hope has been dashed, but still I'm sure we will have a great occasion. Otteline is well known to us here at Cambridge. She is a distinguished plant biologist who became professor of plant development here at the university and then director of the Sainsbury Laboratory. And in her time here, she played, and indeed more widely, she played a key role in leading thinking within the university about science policy and was in particular a huge support for us at the Bennett Institute in her role as a member of our management board. One of the issues that she's long championed, which I've heard her talk about on several occasions, is the importance of research culture and its effects on the quality and effectiveness of the research system. She takes up her role at UKRI at a moment when questions about the social and economic value of research and innovation 
are at the heart of some of the most important policy questions facing government and indeed a wider society. So thanks again, Ottoline, for agreeing to deliver our annual public policy lecture. And now I'm happy to hand it over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much indeed, um, Mike and Christina. It's really a huge privilege to be here and to be able to give this talk. I've enjoyed this series over the years and um, feel uh, slightly intimidated in some ways to be <laughs> on this side of the microphone, so to speak, after the wonderful speakers that have gone before. But I'm very much looking forward to um, telling you something about how I view the research and innovation system in the in the context of, uh, of the economy and in and particular knowledge economy, and even more particularly an inclusive knowledge economy. And um, I'm very keen to get your feedback and, and comments at the end. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that too. Um, <clears throat> I have some slides to help, so I shall share my screen, I hope. Uh, ooh, that's interesting. Um, here we go. Um, here we don't go. Let's try again. Oh, no, maybe we do. Okay, this, this is looking more productive. Where is the PowerPoint? Yeah. Ha, very good. Great. I hope everyone can see that now. So, um, <clears throat> as um, in the very kind introduction, thank you. Um, I have very, well, fairly recently, although time flies, it's actually um, five months now, um, taken over as CEO of UK Research and Innovation. And <clears throat> I'm going to say a little bit about that later, but I want to start by talking about what I consider to be the kind of key challenge in some ways um, facing us as we seek to build this concept of a knowledge economy and particularly an inclusive knowledge economy. How do we create an economy that um, provides uh, the benefit for everybody, not just for a few? And so how you um, create also the, a kind of sense of collective endeavor that comes with that, which I think is so important as we try to um, rebuild our country after the many shocks it's been through over recent years. So I think underpinning at least some of those shocks and the, the level of division that we see in the UK is um, a exclusivity in the economy. So over recent decades, wage inequality has increased significantly, and this is directly associated with um, productivity inequality. And here are two graphs that illustrate those two points. These are graphs that are specifically related to the service industries. So a lot of focus in the context of productivity, for example, is on manufacturing. And whilst that's extremely important in the UK, it's a relatively small part of our economy and it, the issues are, are, are different with manufacturing. Um, in the service sector, we nonetheless see this year on year rise over a prolonged period of time in um, the, the gap between the lowest and the highest paid people. And this is associated with um, a slightly less relentless year on year um, rise, but nonetheless um, a very clear increase in the, the, the disparity between productivity in the best and the worst performing firms. And these two things correlate and, and they go together. So we're opening up these divides in the economy um, where um, we have very um, uh, unevenly distributed um, wages um, and very unevenly distributed productivity. And these are 
unevenly distributed across the country. So both these, all of these factors are, are contributing to, um, the, to inequalities, diverse inequalities that are now systemic in our society. And <clears throat> these gaps have emerged at a time of very rapid social change and also very rapid technological change. And I'm um, slightly um, I'm nervous about quoting your one of your fearless leaders, Diane Coyle, um, but also very honored <laughs> to be able to do that from her very recent book. This was a quote um, found for me by um, colleagues at the ESRC when I was discussing this, this talk with them. They said, this is the perfect quote that you want, and it is. So <laughs> the main candidates to explain this pattern of inequality are globalization and technology, and both have contributed to the increasing wage premium earned by skilled workers, while at the same time limiting increases in the earnings of um, medium and low skilled workers. And on the whole, the evidence supports the idea that it's these large changes, um, it, um, technological changes, that are the main driver of, of this inequality. And as a result, um, there, there are, there's a lot of work demonstrating that many people then feel left behind, um, disempowered, marginalized um, by these very rapid changes that have, have taken away from them a lot of the things that anchored their lives. And um, this is coupled with a, a, a strong belief and evidence indeed that their children will be worse off than they are. Um, in the US, there's a, a lot of work around this concept now emerging of deaths of despair, where actually life expectancy is dropping in a way that correlates with um, these changes because of uh, uh, re the really poor health outcomes for people um, left in this kind of disempowered uh, situation. So it, it's a, a major issue and I, I think a really important and defining issue of our time that is important to address. So how does this map onto the knowledge economy? This, if this process is at least partly uh, underpinned by rapid technological change, and we in the UK have an economy that's very dependent on, on services and so on, rather than manufacturing, and <clears throat> inherently that makes it more dependent on, on knowledge intensive activities, not that manufacturing isn't there, there's a key role for those kinds of skills there too. But nonetheless, um, if we define a knowledge economy as an economy where production and um, services are based on knowledge intensive activities that contribute to an accelerated pace of technical and scientific advance, as well as rapid obsolescence, one can see how um, this uh, kind of buy into the notion of science and technology and a need to be able to adapt very quickly to these rapid changes will become an inherent and embedded part of our, of our economy. And that's something that, that left behind community, um, it, for them, it's an extraordinary challenge. And I think underpins a lot of this division. And you can see that, for example, in this regular survey that is conducted by Bayes on public attitudes to science, where huge proportion of the people um, think that science and technology are really important for the economy. 78% of people think the UK must develop its science and technology sector to remain competitive, but much lower proportion of people think that there will be more work opportunities for the next generation. Lots of people um, actively disagree, and 14% doesn't seem to be very, doesn't seem very high, but in the context of this survey, where overall people are, are expressing quite um, sort of positive ideas about um, science in this case. None, this question actually stands out as being much more negative than, than a lot of the others. And I think this comes down to the fact that we have a, a fundamental uh, divide in our um, society where people think of research and innovation as a, as, a, as a segregated away activity and researchers and innovators is a particular set of people who are not like them. They are not normal people. <laughs> and I, I have a whole nother lecture about this divide, but it, it, it's, it, it, if you just think of what comes into your head when somebody says to you, a, a researcher or an innovator, the image you get is that kind of slightly wild Einstein-like figure who is both 
kind of superhumanly intelligent in some kind of way, but also um, a, a little bit um, kind of detached from the real world. They're maybe, you know, um, driven by some kind of slightly fanatical enthusiasm for their discipline and, um, and a, a kind of um, a sort of dedication to, to sort of logical pursuit of something which is in some way subhuman almost. So it, it's, a, it's a strange depiction of, of, of who that group of people is and it's separate from from normal people in that sense and so and that that builds up this this wall between society and the research and innovation community and that wall i think is is strongly built and reinforced by both sides researchers quite like the idea that they're superhumanly clever and and they they're actually kind of protected by the notion that they're on some logically driven march to the truth capital t because research isn't actually like that at all it's a very uncertain place and the, the idea that you're 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 using some kind of um, hardwired almost logical process is quite reassuring so so researchers quite like that idea <laughs> and um, people quite like that idea because then it's not their responsibility to worry about that stuff um, and they can just um, get on with their lives and these wonderful people will solve it all for, for them but of course it also creates all kinds of problems that there is that divide um, not least for people because they feel disconnected from that world and that contributes to their feeling of disempowerment because the, the tools of research which are fundamentally about problem solving are incredibly valuable tools just for thinking for for, for giving you agency in your everyday life i think and um and uh researchers have this problem that they they they, they you know it, it's kind of permanent imposter syndrome if you have to think of yourself permanently as superhumanly intelligent on, on some um kind of reason driven march to the truth so it's a very problematic divide that i think is in serious need of 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 dismantling uh, it contributes to um, narrowing the range of people who aspire to become researchers and innovators or who want to come into that system at all because it's these slightly strange people who are not normal why would I want to do that it makes it much harder to connect the research and innovation system um, to the to societal needs because because of that disconnect because people it doesn't feel like it's part of society it feels like it's kind of some separate technopolis set up over there um, in, a, in a different place and it then builds this exclusivity into the knowledge economy where um, a, a divide can easily open up between those who feel empowered to take up the extraordinary new technologies that become available and use them to um, drive improvements in their business um, and that you know includes business leaders but also anybody working in those in those businesses um, whilst on the other hand there are people for whom that's a foreign place and they they are finding it very difficult to go there so that even diffusion of those technologies across the economy becomes very difficult so I, I think taking down this segregation is key it's not a question of um, uh, um, researchers um, the, the way that, that this wall is usually con contrived, I think, or conceived is to do with um, a knowledge deficit, which has been debunked a long time ago. It's not about everybody having to know everything or understand everything. It's more about weaving much more deeply the whole concept of research and innovation as a basic human thing into the way people think. And it is a basic human thing. You watch your child your two-year-old investigate the world and that, that it's research and innovation that they're doing it's a hugely fundamental thing that everybody does every day but we've somehow um, professionalized it to the extent that it feels exclusive and that we have to change and we have to change it from both sides of the divide researchers need to um, um, understand more how what they do fits into the wider world really and 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 then deal with the interactions with these key stakeholders from that perspective, rather than from a perspective of I know an awful lot of stuff that you don't know. Uh, and so I need to do my best to help you understand it. it, it that's not the right framing. And similarly, uh, um, people uh, who are not in the system need instead to think of that whole process as much more um, close to their hearts, really close to what they do and what they care about and what they know. And the fact that then there is a knowledge difference, which there will be, is, is not really the point because there's a values connect. And um, 
this core message, I guess, is, is written in my view, deep into the nurse review, which was the review poll nurse um, led, which led to the establishment of UK Research and Innovation, the organization of which I am now CEO. And this is one of my favorite quotes from the review. Um, um, what we need is a compact that bonds science and society, which will deliver both excellent science and ensure that it's used for public good. And I, I, this I think is emblematic of what we need genuinely to try to do to build that compact between science and society. I'm going, to, I'm going to take a kind of two minute interlude here just um, to say something about that word science. I, I've given versions of this talk in a number of contexts now and I've discovered that um, if you say science um, and Paul spends a long time defining that he means science very broadly in, in his review, but nonetheless as soon as you say science the first six questions you get to ask are what about arts and humanities, what about engineering, what about mathematics, what about social science, <laughs> and I think as a community we need to stop what abouting because <laughs> what what that what abouting does is reflect in us the very same thing that I'm talking about here that this um, uh, basic human thing that happens when people are feeling insecure and that resources are limiting, they form these little in-groups that protect and support one another. And part of that involves um, an out-group whom you don't like. That in-group, out-group divide is very deep. It's a, um, a social identity theory, Henri Tajfel, and it's, um, it's happens really quickly. And you can see that going on within academia where people are, are forming their little in-groups according to their disciplines, which involves um, uh, um, being not, not so positive about people in other disciplines. It's, it, it's a really unhelpful and not very useful, particularly in the context of the kind of situation where we're currently um, working, where this community is perceived and um, quite uh, rightly in some ways as a privileged community um, uh, compared to most of the rest of society. And we need um, to work really hard to establish what we're doing as being for the good of society and with society, not just to society. And so I think we need to um, stop worrying about divisions within academia and between academia and business and between different parts of the research and innovation system altogether and rather come together in a collective endeavor to build this compact that bonds science and society and that I'm very keen to move that whole agenda forward and I think in UKRI there is that opportunity to do that as as Paul Nurse set out in his review so um, UKRI is the largest public funder of research and innovation in the UK. We bring together the um, nine councils, about seven disciplinary research councils that um, uh, fund research in, uh, in research institutes and largely in universities and also have a very deep level of engagement with their stakeholder communities, including in business. But also we have Research England, which has that uh, um, funds the block grants into universities in England, works very closely with equivalent bodies in the devolved administrations, and has then that very deep expertise in the university context, including in the, the role of universities as, as um, civic centers, really, their role in local knowledge ex exchange and, um, and society where they are. And then, of course, Innovate UK, which is the UK's innovation agency, which has a deep um, roots right across the business sector, but um, particular expertise in SMEs. So extraordinary opportunity because we connect up the entire research and innovation system and we have um, um, between us this deep uh, in, uh, engagement and interfaces with all kinds of, of stakeholder communities in the real world, if I want to put it that way, and of course a, a very strong interface into government. Um, where I hope the relationships we can build will, will be able to drive kind of um, virtuous circles of providing uh, valuable information and advice into government on um, activity in the research and innovation system and um, thereby promoting the value of that system in government and um, driving high quality um, policy for science as well as um, supporting science for policy. 
So um, in that context, we, uh, um, because we're spending all of this public money, lots of it, and um, we are obviously accountable to government. And we, as I've tried to emphasize our uh, uh, core part, I think, of a very large system, and we need to work with this much wider community in academia, in business, in the public sector, in the third sector, obviously uh, in government, as I said, and, and, and crucially uh, with international partners. But I think um, we represent a, a key node in the research and innovation system because of this breadth and reach we have and because of our close interfaces right across the system. <clears throat> so thinking about that system and how it works, again, what I think we primarily need to make it work better uh, is, is a shift in focus, a shift in the way that we think about it. At the moment, if you say research and innovation, um, uh, you get the, the kind of Einstein figure image for the person. And when you start talking about it more, you mostly get a concept of a kind of linear relationship between a discovery process involving that Einstein-y type person, and then sign of some kind of linear translation-y purpose involving maybe a different sort of Einstein-y innovator to make a product. And, and although everybody knows that there's a problem with this linear model, um, uh, nonetheless, it's somehow hardwired in, into the way we think about things. And it's hardwired into the way we fund and um, monitor what's going on. So um, we tend to put money either into the discovery end or the innovation end, and then we tend to count things that come out in the context of discoveries, so published papers, or um, in the context of products, maybe that's uh, you know, GDP type numbers, or maybe it's patents or something of that sort. But it, 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 our focus on this linear pathway with a beginning and an end that we can fund and measure is a real problem. And indeed, um, it, it, it's acknowledged very widely that this bit in the middle, um, as it's described, it is difficult. It's sometimes called the valley of death. And there are lots of stuff of explanations as to what's wrong, you know, what's missing in the valley of death. And they tend to focus on money, that the, the, the thing that's missing is money. And I think we need to think much more deeply about this system and what it really means to um, moving away from that linear model, what, what, what actually happens to make this happen, <clears throat> make this whole process work. And I think um, at zooming out, what we have to acknowledge is that the whole system is much deeper and wider and broader than the part on which we focus. And that a key element is not the discovery and the product, it's the people in the system. And those people are not the Einstein and the, the inventor type. They are a huge diversity of people who are working in the system, delivering, um, yes, that direct kind of cold face research activity and um, hard work in, in small, um, medium and large businesses to turn that into products, but a much wider range of people right across the economy who are contributing and thinking about this system in, in this much more holistic way instantly um, reduces, I think, the barrier between the system and the rest of society because so many more people are just immediately involved. And if we manage to reconceptualize the system as all of these people, then I think we are um, already moving a long way to breaking down that societal barrier, which is such a problem. And at least as importantly, we are thinking much more directly about how we connect up the system in such a way that people and therefore their ideas and their networks and their know-how and their skills and their understanding also move much more freely for the, through the system. I think that will go a long way towards bridging the valley of death. And I also think it will go a long way towards building those much stronger interfaces with key stakeholders, for example, in government um, and uh, in the wider public through um, the media interactions and so on, um, whereby this idea of science and research and innovation as a, as a sort of separate thing that's done by specialists can be dissolved and it's much more central and core role in building an inclusive knowledge economy can be um, established in a way that genuinely works for everybody and with everybody. That's the overarching vision. And as I say, to do that, I think focusing on the people is, 
is key. That doesn't mean we ignore all the other stuff, but the people are our core element. And this vision of the kind of lone researcher sitting um, in their laboratory or their dusty library or wherever they're sitting, beavering away, we've got to get rid of that. And we've got to add in to the picture all the other people. And that does not just mean the immediate people in, in, in my discipline, when you say the other people, people say, oh yes, we have also to value technicians. And we do have also to value technicians. Um, but we have to value actually everybody who is contributing to that system. Those of you who know the Saintbury Laboratory, which is in the Botanic Gardens where I um, worked until very recently, it, it, it's just a joy to work there. And it's a joy to work there because of all the wonderful researchers and technicians, but also because of all the people who work there, the, the, the people on reception <laughs> provide immediately the kind of atmosphere in that building that, that just lifts you for the day, takes you in and, and uh, it, it's crucial. And I genuinely think that it's super important that all of those people feel like they are contributing to the research endeavor because they are, and that we value them and consider them as part of the system. So a much wider range of people um, working right across the system to, to make it work, to support um, and to catalyze and to enable um, that um, the, the discoveries and the products and everything that goes between them. If all of these types of people genuinely felt engaged that they were part of the system because they are and because we create a system and a culture that values all of them and, and supports all of their careers and aspirations and considers all of their crucial contributions, then I think um, we, we can go a very long way to making that whole concept of knowledge generation and knowledge exploitation much more inclusive. And uh, I strongly suspect that that kind of more open feeling would also encourage a much wider range of people to aspire to all of those roles, including this role on which we are currently focused, which is this guy in the middle. And um, increased diversity for people into that role, I think, is a, a also important, as, as well as all the other roles. And <clears throat> to achieve that connectivity and to really bring in all of those people, I think we also have to consider all the different um, organizations that are involved in, in um, adjacent to the research intensive um, organizations. So obviously uh, uh, in higher education and so on, but also uh, um, we need to connect much better to further education where quite a number of, of, of key people in our system will be training and reach out into the school sector. So really think about the whole um, education system and um, the whole research system. So research is going on in many different parts of our economy and um, thinking about that also in a much more holistic way and supporting people to move between all of these sectors in a much more seamless way is really important. Again, in the university system, uh, you know, uh, when people ask me about my career, um, <clears throat> Until very recently, I used to say I, I went to university and I never left, which is more or less true. Um, I have recently taken this big step outside, <laughs> but I'm hoping to come back. <laughs> and, and that kind of in and out weaving, which I think is very difficult to do, is what we need to find much better ways to support because it's that movement to and fro of people and their ideas and their networks and their skills that I emphasized before that brings that um, connected up system that I think we need. And we need that mobility uh, to, to deliver not only the flow of ideas that drive how this system works um, and not only in the kind of research intensive part of the system, but also um, through uh, the adoption and diffusion of new technologies right across the economy in a way that I hope would help um, to reduce that, um, those gaps that we see um, widening in our economy. So um, that's what I'm hoping to try to build into the way we think about the research and innovation system at UKRI, where obviously our core role is to support that system. And, and so we have a, a kind of refreshed um, vision, which is for an outstanding research and innovation system in the UK that gives everyone the opportunity to, contrib to contribute and to benefit enriching lives locally, nationally and internationally. And um, 
we have many tools to do that. It's not just about money. It's about convening and catalyzing and incentivizing um, in close collaboration with others to build that thriving and inclusive system that connects these parts and it connects discovery to prosperity and public good. So that's uh, the, the goal. And <clears throat> It's very much mirrored and reflected, I'm excited to say, in the government's uh, UK R&D roadmap that was uh, emerged fairly recently, um, or, or fairly rapidly after I took up this post, where I think there is a, a genuine consideration of the system. So the, the goal to raise research ambitions um, through inspiring and enabling talented people and teams is great and um, to use that to drive up innovation and product productivity. And then running through this is this leveling up uh, agenda that, that is very high in, in government priorities at the moment, right across the UK, um, and to develop the world leading infrastructures and institutions that we need to do that um, and um, maintain those um, global collaborations and interactions all underpinned by a, a healthy research and innovation system in terms of its sustainability and also its, its culture and practices. And, and overall to engage a wider range of voices and perspectives in research and development to shape our endeavor and inspire a new generation of researchers and innovators. And so this whole approach, I think, is uh, there is an opportunity to push forward this much more inclusive understanding of research and innovation and um, to connect up the work that one does uh, um, at, in a very kind of blue skies, bottom up discovery driven way, genuinely to um, public good through that highly networked system. That, that's the idea. And as I say, we have these multiple tools to do that. It's not just about money, it's about convening and catalyzing. So listening, uh, we need to, as a, an organization at UKRI, listen to people, understand um, what's going on. And uh, I'm very interested in, in much deeper co-creation with relevant communities of everything that we do and um, uh, trying not only to use that to build policies that we enact, but also to catalyze uh, new activities right across uh, the system and to think very carefully about the incentives that we build into the system to um, support the kinds of behaviors that we want to value that much wider range of people, for example, and, and to think about that in everything that we do, all our policies, all the choices that we make and um, how we behave. And then obviously money is rather important in all of this, even though I've um, mentioned the other things very strongly and um, money is one of the strong ways that one can incentivize things. So thinking very carefully about um, how we invest money in people, in ideas and in infrastructure. And I think infrastructure should not just be physical infrastructure. We have to think about the social infrastructure that underpins the kind of networks that I'm talking about. The, the roles in the system whose job it is, um, people whose job it is to connect people, not just to, to do things on the lab floor or in the library or wherever it is. Um, so social infrastructure like that and, and um, social infrastructure in the context of things, activities that bring people together in different permutations and combinations. I think that's very important. And um, those permutations and combinations need to include that much wider range of stakeholders, as well as the people who currently consider themselves to be um, core members of the system. And then of course, UKRI actually conducts, quite, we, have, we have quite a lot of research um, organizations that we um, are wholly part of, of UKRI. And we need to make very sure that um, the way those are working reflects um, broadly that the values that I've um, discussed. And so uh, in the context of people, for example, we are thinking very hard about all of those categories uh, and what we might do to um, invest much more intelligently in the way we support people, strengthening very diverse uh, career pathways through the system um, uh, to incentivize the kinds of behaviors I think we need to um, promote this open, inclusive system that recognizes a much wider range of essential contributions that, that the system needs. And then um, uh, catalyzing con and convening to bring together all of these different sorts of people, um, uh, listening very hard uh, in the way that I've described, and then leading by example through our um, research centers as key. So <laughs> I think a lot of the points that I've been trying to make 
have been very well um, illustrated in some ways and that the pandemic also generates the opportunities to shift the dial on a lot of these problems. So um, research and innovation has been absolutely kind of front and center in the pandemic. We've had, um, you know, the government chief scientific advisor standing on the television next to the prime minister every day for weeks, being a person. I think just seeing all of these people who are key members of um, the, the community and seeing them as people has been really important. Um, and that's one of the reasons I've always been a very strong supporter of, of kind of hands-on public engagement, not because of that knowledge deficit, but just showing up on a Saturday in a tent outside the plant science department and being a person is itself a, a really important um, kind of starting point to building the kind of relationships that we need. Um, we've also seen that um, this kind of uh, genius logical march to the truth thing is not really how, how it works. Um, uh, you, you don't know anything, you're helpless, you uh, um, uh, create ideas and hypotheses based on other things that you do know about. And then as you collect evidence, your ideas evolve and change as the evidence grows. And that living process front and center, I think has been really valuable. And then just the discoveries that you make or the understanding that you get from the data is not enough to produce high quality policy. Um, you've got to take that on board, but then you have to ask yourself, what are your priorities? What are, what are the things that you value? How are we going to use this information? What are the outcomes we really want? And again, um, I think that's been a really useful part of the debate. There is no right answer. Um, it's a question of taking your understanding of the system and using it in a way that you hope um, uh, is able best to get you to where you want to go. So uh, research and innovation can help you to navigate this extraordinary amount of uncertainty there is in the world, and they are incredibly powerful tools for doing that, but they will not eliminate uncertainty, and we need to use them in the context of what we're trying to achieve and to support uh, our, what I hope um, is some kind of collective endeavor, a shared responsibility to get us to where we want to go. And then, of course, I, mean, I think very powerfully illustrated has been the many different sorts of skills and contributions that we need um, to reap the benefits of research and innovation in the context of a, a major national crisis like that. So I think this moment in time with all of these instabilities um, does create um, it, it, extraordinary opportunities again to, to take what we've learned, to take the momentum and to, to take the kind of national mood almost, which is at some level one of deep anxiety, but another level um, uh, uh, one of a, a shared um, desire to move forward and make things better uh, and to take that and, and to enact and then to build a much more cohesive, connected society. And I, I think research and innovation has a, a key role to play in that for all of the reasons that I hope I've set out. And this kind of picture where um, so many more people feel included and involved is very much where I would like to get to in the years I have at, at um, UKRI. And I very much hope that everybody in the community will, um, will contribute to building that system such that um, ultimately this divide between um, the research and innovation system and people, we can go and can go and, and, and there's just people with these extraordinary tools that research and innovation give us um, to help navigate the incredible uncertainties that we are facing together. And I would like to stop there and thank you very much for listening. And I'm really looking forward to your questions and comments and ideas. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Laser. That has been a lot of food for thought in your lecture, the role of science, the relationships uh, between technology and people, and, and definitely um, the idea, this idea of using science for, for the public good and how to change opinions, I think is, is really relevant. Uh, we have already uh, some questions in the chat. As I mentioned before, uh, we want to make this event as real as possible. So what I will do is to ask yourself to unmute. 
keep kind of brief the question so we can take as many as possible uh, on leave. Uh, and I would like to start and call uh, Dame Fiona and Reynolds, uh, who has put um, a question in the chat. So uh, Dame Fiona, if you can unmute yourself, please. And, and post your question to, to uh, Professor Leiser, that would be great. Well, thank you very much. And, and can I be the first to say what a fantastic lecture that was? I think your insight and your humanity just in itself are going to move things forward, I'm sure. Um, but I'm just interested in your use of the word stewardship, because in my field, it's a word that's very often used, but in a quite loose way. And um, I mean, you did address the elements of stewardship, but I wonder what you thought the key obstacles were to stewardship. Thank you. That is a very interesting question. Hello, Fiona. <laughs> um, uh, I think um, I, 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 so I brought the word in quite early for a variety of reasons. Um, and one is to counter the notion that a system like this, which is a it's a complex system with many feedback interactions and interconnected parts and all the rest of it. It is not the case that you can control it top down. You just can't. And a lot of the narrative about um, it, the kind of interventions that anybody might make in the system are that top down narrative. We're gonna, we're gonna drive this and we're gonna make that happen. And we're gonna, <laughs> all of those kinds of words. And, and I, I don't think it helps you think about policy interventions because, because the system just doesn't work that way. So um, partly the, the, the term to me is, is a, um, a balance to the idea of top-down control. It's more about thinking, really thinking and understanding the system and the different parts in it and how one can um, steward it, shepherd it, move it in a kind of gradual and consensual way to a better place where um, the, oh, the system overall is optimized and, and, and rather than, um, than, yeah, trying to force particular outcomes from particular parts of the system, which is, uh, I think, a way a lot of the, the dis discussion typically works. So that's, that's, that's one element to it. But I, I agree with you um, also that there is this wider element to it, which makes it a, a, a really um, good word, which is this notion of a kind of long-term care for something that you understand is uh, an asset for the nation in perpetuity. And one needs to take and think about it in that long-term way. And to uh, it, it maps a little bit onto this idea that, that so many people are kind of part of it and, and, and benefit from it and, and need to be, feel kind of bought into it. It's a collective endeavor. And that's another thing that I think that the stewardship work um, does. And, uh, you know, also actually, uh, contrasts a little bit to the language that um, is quite often used, which is much more one of kind of thrusting leadership. You know, we're gonna, we're gonna lead the world, we're gonna do this. And, <laughs> and it's not that, I've, that I'm sort of against the idea of, of us being absolutely fantastic. I'm all in favor of it. <laughs> but I think we have, to, we have to think about that as a collective endeavor rather than a competitive elbow everybody else out of the way endeavor. And those language shifts, I think are important to, to try to, to bring people in. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the next comment in the chat is, uh, well, there are several, Udai Patke. So if you can keep it brief <laughs> and, and yeah, that could be uh, very much appreciated. So we can take uh, several of them, but you have been very active during the, the session. So thank you very much. Your turn. Thank you very much. I, I think I've unmuted. So Oseline, thank you for a great presentation. Lots of food for thought. Um, my question really is about where do you see the role of impact? Because that's the one word I did not hear mentioned in your talk, uh, the impact of science of research and innovation. What role do you think uh, UKRI can and should play in terms of trying to create better impacts? Um, absolutely. So I think that word was actually, I mean, the word was not in my talk, but the concept was at the very heart of it. And I think that's at, uh, at some level another part of this language shift 
Um, it, the, the way that, that the narrative is set up at the moment is that there is research and then it has some impact. And I, I think that segregates those two things in a way that's not very helpful. And we need to join the whole thing up. And um, although, um, you know, a lot of researchers get very anxious about the idea that, that, that public good, if you want to, I mean, it's a fairly vague term, but um, uh, societal benefit, prosperity, again, I mean, I'm, if Diane's on the call, she will come up with the perfect definition of the thing we're trying to achieve. <laughs> Some kind of notion of, of um, society level benefit and some cohesion, I guess, in, in bringing people together, in helping to build a society that supports everybody um, in, in a positive way. That's what, you know, that's what we're all trying to do. That's the collective endeavor of, of the country. And that's what research and innovation is about. That in no way means you can't do, have some people over here doing completely curiosity driven research because they love it and they think it's fun. Um, and the whole kind of point really about my um, iceberg is that there are many, many, many people in there working in very different ways, but collectively we need to be delivering that um, public benefit. And that, that's how I see it. So I see impact as, as uh, in that sense, the emergent property of the system that everything should be delivering um, and not as a separate thing. Not a, you don't, it's not somebody does the research and somebody does the impact. It's that collective endeavor uh, for, for public benefit that everybody shares that means that everybody across the system, whatever they're doing is working um, to, to deliver that either um, explicitly or implicitly. Um, I, 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 maybe that's too waffly, but that's how I feel about it. <laughs> no, I think, I think that's clear enough. I, I look forward to seeing how you're going to make that happen. So <laughs> you have a big <laughs> challenge on your hands. So um, all the help you want, we're all here to help you. So thank you. Yeah. <laughs> OK, I'll unmute uh, Christina so you can give other people. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, the next one in the chat, we have Abdul Malik Al Nasir. Please, if you can unmute yourself and post your question directly. Um, thank you so much. I'm a first year um, PhD um, here at Cambridge um, and was very fortunate to get uh, an ESRC scholarship uh, at the very last minute uh, under the widening participation um, strand. And um, what I'm concerned with was how difficult it is for people like me who've come through uh, a less conventional pathway through education to actually get the funding necessary to do postgraduate research, even when we're doing things in our professional lives that are having a wide um, social impact um, because the criteria has been set on first class honors degree, masters with distinction, um, and then it goes into a high level of of competition there. So a lot of people um, who haven't traveled that path because of a variety of different social factors, um, which are prevalent within the black community, for instance, um, would not necessarily uh, qualify for. So what, what would be done in strategically to, um, to enable um, the, the, the kind of inclusive model that you're talking about to actually uh, gestate Absolutely. So I think that is a, that is a really, um, a really important question, and it applies right across the whole system. It's it's um, not um, just for early career people. We uh, and in some ways, uh, I think for um, misguided but nonetheless good reasons, have decided that in order to uh, improve equality and diversity and inclusion, we need to have um, these these kind of explicit criteria for what we're looking for um, so that everybody has an equal chance <laughs> but then the explicit criteria that we set turn out to be a rather narrow b don't match onto what we're really interested in they're just proxy measures in some way shape or form and c exclude all kinds of people who have not had the opportunity to demonstrate that they um, have exactly what people are, what we are looking for, um, but they haven't been able to tick those narrow boxes. So I think what we need to do is um, move to assessment criteria that allow a much wider range of evidence types to support um, the things that we're genuinely looking for. So um, in, in the context of research and innovation, it, it will be to do with 
you know, the idea you've had for a research project, for example, or um, the contributions you've already made to um, knowledge generation in some kind of way, but also I think the much wider range of skills that are absolutely crucial to high quality research and innovation. So um, um, collaboration and, and um, mentoring and nurturing the people around you, I think that's a key um, uh, attribute. Um, willingness to be part of the community to contribute much, much more widely to the research and innovation system through the wider activities that you undertake and then yeah, engagement with a whole range of stakeholders that I've talked about and I think all of those things are essential for researchers and I think one should be able to evidence those absolutely through practice-based routes that you talked about um, through just yeah, and so we're beginning to roll that out. We've just uh, introduced, a, or we are in the process of introducing a new CV format for people applying for grants later in the system. That is about that, um, a narrative description of how you've um, contributed in those ways rather than list your papers, list your grants. And I think you're absolutely right. We need to roll that back um, right across the system to ask when, we're, when um, students are applying for, for PhD studentships, what's the evidence that you'll be a good research student, not have you got a first class degree in this subject? Um, because have you got a first class degree in this subject might be a useful piece of evidence to demonstrate that you'll be a good research student, but there are hundreds of other ways to do it. So I, I completely agree with you. We need to be much more thoughtful about what we really want and, and the multiple different ways in which people can demonstrate that. Thank you. Uh, next one on the chat, we have Henry Timbambli. Uh, please unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, hi, Austin. That was uh, absolutely fascinating and it's triggered hundreds of thoughts, uh, but I shall restrict myself to, to two. Um, the first was just, a, there's such a, a thought, which is there's such a close resonance between what you described as wanting to do, getting people out of university and circulating them in the real world between uh, what the civil service is trying to do at the moment um, and find ways of circulating civil servants out of the civil service and then back in. And if you haven't spoken to, or you probably have, but if you haven't spoken to Alex Chisholm about that, yeah. uh, there is almost certainly you could piggyback on each other's, um, each other's work. The second was a question. I was trying to understand the framing of the valley of death. And I, I had a, a kind of specific question as it relates to the food system. So uh, there's a school of thought in, uh, in particular in agriculture from uh, certain sides of the system that a lot of money goes into the kind of interesting science, gene research, AI, robots. Uh, and at the same time, there's a huge benefit to be had in just getting farmers to use existing best practice, existing yeah. innovation. We're kind of moving on before we've even got adoption of some quite yeah. basic practices. Mm -hmm. Some people frame that in terms of a training need, but some people frame it in terms of a research and innovation need. So they say, we should be funneling social science research into how we can get take up of these things. And I just wondered, is that, is what I've described the valley of death? And if it is, does UKRI or does research innovation have a role to play in solving it? Or is that, or is that someone else's, is that someone else's job? Um, so at some level, the, there, there actually, I, I'd say there are a couple of different questions in there that uh, address slightly different elements in the system. I think um, the food system is really interesting um, because uh, the, the value chains in the food system are really complicated. So that linear pathway is, is built very heavily on um, um, pills and widgets, as I call it. So pharmaceutical companies and engineering, big engineering, where um, the, the, the product is a definable thing that you sell and um, you know who's going to make the money. And that, um, that 
sets up the value chain in a way that um, you know those companies are the ones that are really R and D intensive, and they have quite strong collaborations with the research and innovation um, system right across it, and they fund directly research in universities. And you know the research councils have the collect. It, it's a it's a well understood system because the where the money is made is so straightforward, and the food system where the money is made is horrendously complicated. Um, it's very distributed across the system and, and it, 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 it's not straightforwardly linked to the places where you want to um, drive the adoption and diffusion of the technology. So, um, you know, farmers' margins are, are relatively tight and um, persuading farmers, if you want to put it that way, to change a practice in a way that might give them a very small um, shift or might have an environmental benefit, for example, but wouldn't really have a massive um, financial benefit. It, it's a difficult system for adoption and diffusion because the value chain is so complicated. So I think that's that's a, a, a slightly different problem and um, has, I mean, in, in the old days, there used to be public extension services. So people who would, you know, wander around farms providing advice and support to, gov to um, farmers paid for by government. And that's an interesting model. I mean, is that the right model? I, I, good question, well worth exploring. Um, that's not quite the, the same as asking, um, are there new and different ways to do adoption and diffusion that, uh, in a more general way? And there, I think, you know, uh, uh, we could learn a lot from actually development in, in um, third world countries where there is massive uh, um, shift in that whole process of extension through technology, through mobile phone apps and those kinds of things. So I think that there are a variety of, of different ways to address that question. It is a question in the food system that is really important. Um, and I think it's one of those things that will need multiple parallel interventions to fix rather than a single one and I think it's the responsibility of all of us working in the system at all parts of it to try to figure out how we can join it up better. Thank you. Thank you very much. David Cliffley, please. Thank you. Uh, Otheline, that was a great lecture. Um, lots to think about as always. Um, my question's really about the system and what we know about it. Because um, I think we feel, it feels a bit as if we're the kind of master builders of the uh, building the cathedrals. Um, and the reason why we admire them so much is that the ones that survive are the ones that have survived. The ones where the master builders made mistakes have all fallen down. If they knew a bit more about engineering, they might have actually managed to make them last for longer. Um, so what are the, in your system that you want to create, and I'm, I'm, I'm literally going to just put that up because if I want to know about genetics, I go to a, a book you recommended, right? So, um, but, but if I want to know how to make these systems, where do I get that information from? Where are the gaps in our knowledge if we want to engineer this kind of system? Um, so that's um, also a very interesting question. And uh, it, 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 it's, um, I mean, it's one of the things that I, that I think is interesting. A huge amount of, of systems understanding comes from engineering. But in engineering, you, 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 build, you build a system there. You know, you are the master builder. Um, I'm a biologist. And in biology, most things are built by evolution. <laughs> and um, they work surprisingly well, despite the fact that there is no master builder in that sense. And, and um, evolution, uh, um, uh, so there you, you wind up you know, creating diversity in all kinds of ways through very interesting feedbacks that work across the system. And, and I think the research and innovation system is probably somewhere in between the two. One has more control over it than um, domestication, which I guess would be the, you know, what we would want to do to an evolved system in an engineering type way. Um, but uh, I think it's a mistake to think we can rip it all up and start again and build and engineer the perfect system. We have to get from where we are now to where we want to be. So it's got to be, we've got to think of it in an, in, as an evolutionary process. And then uh, how do we do that? How do we understand those feedbacks? I think we have quite a lot of 
information and understanding about those feedbacks um, from the impacts of things that we have done to intervene. So, you know, the incentives that come in through the REF and things like that, um, we, we've been able to see what, what, what effects and impacts those things have had. Um, so we, capturing that more explicitly, I think is important. And then I, I'm, you know, I'm spent most of my research career um, building computational models of, of developmental biology systems, which are also systems which um, build themselves over time through a whole series of interconnected feedback loops. And I, 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 I think there's genuinely a place for, for active modeling of the system and, and, and understanding better how those feedback loops really work, or at least generating strong hypotheses about how they work based on the data we have already, and therefore how we might most effectively intervene. Um, I think there are as I say, some fairly obvious things that we've talked about before. For example, um, Abdul uh, described how the criteria we've used, which at some level are, are a kind of gateway to the system, are clearly excluding all kinds of really good people that we want in and reinforcing the, the false value given to those criteria because then everybody in the system um, ticks those boxes. And, and that's, that's a kind of obvious feedback that you can think that's not right. That's not what we want to do. Let's change those criteria. So I think you can do a lot despite the scariness of the systems analogy, just with fairly straightforward common sense. And then as you work forward to build more sophisticated understanding of those feedbacks, I think um, we, we are in a reasonable position to be able to do more sophisticated interventions, I hope. Thank you. Uh, Gunet Malik. Yeah, um, hi. Um, good evening, Professor Lesa. Um, uh, nice to meet you. Uh, I've just completed my MBA from the Judge Business School behind me. And um, I just wanted to ask that from the perspective of dealing with businesses, how is UKRI or Innovate UK, which I think is a dedicated arm for that purpose, dealing to sort of in, uh, ease more regulations uh, for businesses and uh, and, and, and going a little more specific, is there a dedicated startup policy for the UK in the works? Um, and I'm not sure there is. Uh, and I just wanted to know if I could, you know, plant that seed uh, in your head or something. So, yeah, so um, we, UKRI, um, all, all parts of UKRI deal with businesses, large and small, but you're absolutely right that Innovate UK is the UK's uh, innovation agency. Um, I and traditionally over the last few years they have focused mostly on um, a variety of funding mechanisms for small businesses rather than um, thinking broadly about um, innovation policy but I think there is um, now a strong appetite for thinking much more um, um, yeah, broadly in that context about um, the environment the wider environment that's needed for um, businesses of all sizes, but certainly small uh, SMEs and, and that whole scale up process to work well. And so um, policy and regulation are, are really central to that. Um, I am interested in the idea that one might have a kind of generic SME policy that would be useful. It seems to me that I, there's a massive diversity across the SME system. And and, uh, and I would, yeah, you know, if you wanted to get in touch or anybody else did about what a generic policy would look like that would really help everybody, I would be really interested in that. I, I'm, I'm, my, my instinct is that um, one needs to think uh, somewhat differently in different sectors, but I may be wrong and I'd be very interested to hear ideas. Thanks a lot. Um, Next one, while we have a comment about the impact, we have already answered it. Uh, Alistair Nolat, a bridge in the OECD. I really like the uh, bracket <laughs> information. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for the talk. It was great and uh, very, very exciting. Thank you. Just to go to the point, not so much about the nature of the research system and how best to engineer it, but to the point of inclusiveness. And um, it seems to me that the linchpin here really is skills. And um, because we in the UK seem to underperform sort of in a global context, at least in terms of generic skills. And um, we have these elite centers of learning and research, but we also have a long tail of low skilled individuals. And at least from the research I've seen it's skills which really the prime driver of technology diffusion and even the private sector investment money tends to follow skills 
rather than uh, the other way around. So I just wonder what the role of UKRI is in this connection and what thoughts you may have. I know it's a kind of perennial problem about raising overall levels of educational attainment, but and also specifically, what do you think needs to be done around STEM skills? Thank you. Yes, so I think um, uh, this is another one of these, these kind of multifaceted uh, problems. I think the kind of big picture stuff I talked about today, which is about kind of barrier removal, is immediately helpful from that point of view because a, a higher proportion of people then would think about that sector as somewhere where they, there is a place for them. Um, so I think that's key. And I think valuing that much wider range of roles is also extremely relevant um, because one of the, the things that I think underpins our skills problem is the serious underinvestment in the, in the further education sector in those kind of middle level qualifications. Um, we have A levels and then we have degrees and we have almost nothing in between that is properly supported and valued. And, and it comes back to this notion that um, we, we are very bad at valuing difference, at valuing diversity, at saying we like all of these things. And we acknowledge that for a really healthy system, we need people with in all of these categories to be contributing. We, we, we seem to favor a model where, where there's one thing that you value and everybody should be allowed to, uh, to aspire to it. And I think that's fundamentally um, problematic way of thinking about it. And that's one of the things that's led to the, the um, the hollowing out of that middle system, the FE system, and also a, a, a system across universities that is driving homogenization. It's, it's arguing that every university should be the same, whereas I think every university should be different. We don't, you know, we're a relatively small country. We have no reason to have, you know, 140, whatever it is, identical institutions. We want, we want different ones specializing in different things, that are giving different things to students and different things to the economy. And, um, and creating a system that supports and values and incentivizes difference is I think, you know, the, the fundamental principle that underlies quite a lot of what I talked about. Thank you. Patrick Dunleavy. I'm sorry if I haven't pronounced adequately. No, that's right, exactly. Thank you very much for a wonderful lecture, very inspiring and hopeful. But um, I wonder if the fly in the ointment isn't really the problem of uh, not really in UCRI, but really the people that you're talking to in government, particularly the civil servants and politicians. So if we look at, for example, the current crisis, there's been, uh, well, most people would say there's been a, a failure to anticipate uh, really what the implications of a pandemic impact on the UK might have been. Public Health England last year had a, a, a funding amount of £86 million on preventing infectious diseases, which seems a very small amount. Uh, a few years back, the civil service did a review of stockpiling in the NHS and concluded that um, uh, they could save £50 million a year by cutting the amount of uh, PPE and so on. So the, and yet we've we've spent, uh, you know, billions of pounds on acquiring PP urgently at the last minute in competition with everybody else this year, and we've spent hundreds of billions of pounds on uh, coping with the impact of uh, COVID nineteen uh, from a very poor initial position. So there seems to be a, a, a fundamental problem with government being able to accept warnings and advice that they get from social scientists, from public health people, from, from uh, risk modeling groups and, and so on, uh, an inability to really think through what a sustainable policy stance might be and to achieve an optimum, which actually builds in some sort of resilience. So we lose, you know, large amounts of money in the global financial crisis we've lost a huge amount we we're going to have a, a public sector debt overhang for 20 years from the COVID-19 and yet you know you're wandering around <laughs> fixing the minutiae of you know agricultural breeding or inventing new gizmos for 
Maseratis or whatever it is that you're doing, but you're not really coping with this big central problem that the system is very, very bad at accepting the results of research and uh, incorporating it into its decision making. So, so um, I, I understand the nature of the of the narrative that you've built up, but actually, I, I, I don't think I would diagnose it in quite the same way. I think our system has worked very hard to optimize the wrong thing. <laughs> so I think uh, a lot of the push has been, it, 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 everybody's keen on efficiency and um, efficiency has, be, has been defined as, as, um, as, uh, um, as cheap as possible and as minimal as possible. Um, and uh, instead we need to think about um, efficiency in the context of rapid change where robustness becomes uh, important and that and those um those things that you talked about that we haven't valued become inherently valued so if you're if you're optimizing for the wrong thing you will wind up with a system that's great under these circumstances and rubbish under those circumstances and if you're living in a world where circumstances change fast then actually efficiency becomes about resilience in a way that i don't think it has been in in, in the political narrative for, for quite some time and and i think the i mean that there are I'm not saying our political system is perfect. There are all kinds of problems in government. You know, Henry might want to come back in and start talking about trying to do things cross government departments, which is really hard. But nonetheless, if you point the system at optimizing the right thing, um, I, I think uh, we can do an awful lot better than we have done in this particular case. And again, coming out of these various crises, if we are able to learn those lessons and think harder about um, resilience as opposed to um, uh, minimizing cost, then I think we could build back into a much better situation. And I would say a lot of that thinking is hugely dependent on, on research and innovation of various sorts. And, and so I am, well, I'm, I am a hopeless optimist, or maybe I'm a hopeful optimist. And I think that's important. Otherwise, how do you get out of bed in the morning? <laughs> I'm sorry, I had a technical problem. Am I back? Yes, you are. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I have a problem because with the technical uh, difficulty, I have lost the chat. So I think Shima Barakat, she was the next one, but I'm not sure, just by uh, heart. Correct me if I am wrong. Thank you. I Yeah, because I think it was potentially Uday again. Um, Thanks, Otlin. You know, I'm very much on the same page. And I was kind of pondering that new systems need new mindsets, new skills, new spaces, diversity of people and things more broadly. How do we avoid the blind leading the blind? Where do we train? Is there skills training? But yet, how do we shift the people into this new space so we can move to these different values and mindsets ourselves? before we can even transmit them to others? Um, I think that's a very interesting question. I think uh, that there are, there are a number of things I can say about that. One, um, in academia at any rate, I think we can do a much better job at valuing and supporting leadership. And I don't mean, you know, and one of the things that, that I find interesting is when you say leadership skills to people in academia, they, they think of the vice chancellor. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, leadership is something everybody, everybody needs to understand and know how to do. And, and, and um, as soon as you're, you think about your responsibility as being wider than your own immediate path in front of you, um, which everybody is keen to do. It's not that that's a problem or alien or whatever. It's just all the current incentives push you into this tunnel vision. As soon as you have that incentive and opportunity and encouragement to think more broadly, I think that is quite surprisingly quickly transformative. Mm -hmm. And I think we need, we need to give people um, that personal responsibility back 
and um, allow them to exercise it and support them when they do in a way that we we have not been good at and it, it it's interesting because again it's one of those things that sort of in a crisis um splits on the one hand people get anxious and are very keen to blame somebody else but on the other hand they are somehow locally willing to rise to the challenge in an extraordinary way and help all of their colleagues so we can capture that positive element and expand it out to the system then i then then we'll be in in really good shape and i i I think you know people want to make a difference they want to do the right thing on the whole and um and so i think the opportunity is there if we if we release that um really bottled um, ambition through supporting it and and universities absolutely are in a key position to do that i think we need to build that much more deeply right across the way we teach the way we support our staff Thank you. Uh, next one is Louis Goffet. Sorry. That's okay. It's Louis. Uh, I'm a civil servant. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your lecture. I just wondered um, how you would advise bridging the gap between people like me and researchers. So it kind of builds on your earlier point around we've been optimizing for the wrong problem. Um, kind of in a practical sense, how would you bridge that gap? Um, I would tell you to go and talk to Rob at the Centre for Science and Policy, who will happily connect you with hundreds of researchers who will be very keen to talk to you about whatever it is you need to know. Um, and I mean, I, I, that's a kind of slightly facetious answer, but not very, because uh, uh, what the Centre for Science and Policy does is it acts as part of this social infrastructure I've talked about that connects things back up and gives people easy access to the kind of um, wide range of things that people in your position um, need to have. Um, I, I think, um, so I think that's a, one key element to it. Um, and um, as um, Henry mentioned, that there is a increasing enthusiasm for, for driving that kind of churn across the system to make sure that, that different parts of it understand other parts of it better. I think the other thing that COVID has done is drive up the imperative for improving data flow in government, which was shockingly not very good before and is now better. And I think that will also, that data flow and data analysts, they, those kind of tools in government will be incredibly helpful to, to supporting that, that kind of gap. Um, and I, I, yeah, that kind of cross government working again, um, I think is, is is key to understanding and articulating the challenges that we face in that more holistic context. So there's a, there's a whole range of, of things and it's mostly about joining up. Everything's in, in the end. Thank you. I would add it's very hard to work across government from within government as well. You're quite right. Thank yeah. you. Um, the CSA network is doing a very good job, I think. Um, Thank you. Uh, JD, uh, next one in the chat. Um, hello, uh, welcome to your recognition of stakeholders in research. And I wonder how you will assess your, how, how you'll assess what your funding has achieved out of the aims that you were talking about, the inclusivity and the broadening of benefits across uh, society. Absolutely. So this is a this is a really interesting question, and it's quite high on our agenda at the moment, because um, as we've previously discussed, on the one hand, everybody would like to be able to measure the things that um, in the that we're interested in in the research and innovation system. Uh, it's the same in terms of you know deciding who gets the grant or who gets the studentship or whatever, um, and also in terms of outcomes, the things we're really interested in, like social cohesion or um, um, those kinds of things are a they're quite hard to measure although people are doing a, a, a valiant job and b the relationship between what I do in, you know on Monday morning <laughs> and some shift in that kind of societal cohesion or something or other um, it, it's not going to be a straightforward linear relationship and I'm going to be finding it very difficult to prove that that intervention 
really connected to that outcome. So I've got to think um, much harder about the things that I can measure and assess that I have some chance of linking to the interventions that I've made um, and that in some way correlate and relate to these much broader objectives that, that I'm interested in. And that uh, actually is an incredibly challenging job um, to, to build a kind of monitoring and evaluation framework that is sufficiently sophisticated to capture um, the outputs in a way that genuinely reflects what I'm interested in um, uh, without, uh, but is a, you know, also not uh, an incredibly expensive and difficult thing to do. Uh, and I actually view monitoring and evaluation as one of the most difficult things in my job. We're working very hard to think now about how we can build, uh, we're calling it a balanced scorecard approach. So a, a, a basket of things that we can measure and where we build it into the, the framework in a way that does not rely overly heavily on a small number of things because we know every single one of those things is insufficient and um, not um, going to capture what we're trying to do. And many of them also the other real danger with picking um, things that, you know, kick key performance indicators is this notion that more is better. And quite often what you're interested in is the sweet spot, not too few and not too much. And so the target for those measures is also really important. So uh, um, uh, I guess my answer to your question is it's really, really difficult it's important for building an evidence base, both in terms of um, long-term uh, um, government policy, but also in terms of understanding whether the interventions we're making are really genuinely delivering. We have to be very willing to embrace much more deliberative, qualitative measures and not worry too much about things we can objectively count because they very seldomly uh, um, capture the things that we're really interested in. And then we need to use that basket, that wide variety of things that without overly relying on anyone in particular. And if anybody on this call has brilliant ideas, I would so like to hear them because I, I must say, I think it's probably the thing that's the hardest to do out of all the things that I need to do. Thank you very much. Stephen, Stephen Mick. Hi. Um, yes, yeah, Steve Mickey, I'm, I'm afraid I'm not going to turn the video on because I'm in the middle of cooking roast chicken. Um, <laughs> so, um, um, I just, it wasn't, I mean, you, I'm an ex-civil servant now in, in, in the academia and you can see I've become an academic because it was more a comment than a question. Um, but I just wanted to ask you, I guess, ask you the question about the brokerage role because, you know, as Louis said, liaising between government departments is tough enough, um, but then liaising with, you know, uh, 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 150 universities is also quite difficult. I wondered how you saw um, the kind of brokerage role um, uh, within the, you know, the interface with policy. Yeah, so I, I personally think that, that brokerage of all kinds in, in, in joining up is really important and it's an undervalued thing because it costs money and what you buy is, is connectivity. And whilst connectivity, in my view, as you will have gathered, is absolutely essential in the system, it's not, it's not a, um, normally the, the kind of outcomes that people are trying to measure, which are, you know, papers and patents and things like that, don't, you, you, again, you don't see that obvious connection. And so, so it's very undervalued. And it's hard work and actually needs quite stable funding because it's about relationship building on the whole. And um, so I, I think getting um, uh, the notion that that brokerage is important and valued and we need to support it properly long term is, is a, a key um, element. An interesting thing becomes, though, you know, exactly exactly the model that works for different parts of the system. Um, and, and, you know, what sort of person you need and where they should, you know, where, their, where should their, their day job be, so to speak, um, whilst they're bringing together all of those people. And is it about individuals or, or is it a more like CSAP, which is a kind of organization almost that has that brokerage model. Um, uh, it it organises the connections rather than um, being the person that goes round itself and does the connection. So there's lots of, it's a very interesting function that I think we need to think about harder in the context of how to fund it, where it fits and exactly what to do for each context. 
Thank, thanks very much. That's a great answer. And I didn't say thank you for your excellent talk as well. Thank you. And enjoy the chicken. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Dania Feiler, please. Thank you. I'm not cooking anything, so I uh, will put my <laughs> camera on. <laughs> um, I, I was really struck by the idea of uh, R&I for the public good. And I think often when we think about the innovation part of that, we think about the technology and engineering disciplines. But if we're thinking about innovation for the public good, I think there's a strong imperative to include uh, a, a social sciences basis in that as well. Um, so I'm thinking about entrepreneurship as well and increasingly a, a move towards um, encouraging public good related uh, startups and things like that. And, you know, I think um, partly it might be to do with the structure of universities in that these disciplines sometimes can be overly separated. Um, and we do see perhaps a flow of ideas from social sciences into policy but I would be really curious to hear your perspective about how perhaps we could do a better job of encouraging social sciences based or social sciences informed innovation. Thank you. Absolutely. So this is really another another connectivity question. Um, I think um, quite a number of people working in technology and engineering would would slightly bristle at the idea that what they do isn't for public good. I think a lot of those tech interventions are incredibly targeted at public good. Um, but I also agree with you that thinking more broadly about uh, entrepreneurship and, and um, the, the framing of the, the, the framing around it, um, one, you can frame it very differently. And, and each of those has, has validity and is important. And a, a public good framing, I think, um, with a social science underpinning, but you know, social science underpinning you actually need for the, for the whole piece. It's not just for the public good part, <laughs> um, uh, I think is, is key. And um, we're, we're kind of back to diversity. We, we need a system that, that values those different approaches, different framings, different ways of thinking about things, acknowledging that uh, a multi, faceted system is a stronger, more robust system um, that um, delivers more broadly into the economy. Um, how to do it? Well, um, we're back to the, the siloing and interdisciplinarity problem that we see in a, in a lot of universities, but we also see fantastic examples of where that's broken and, um, and extraordinary interdisciplinary um, organizations and institutions and undergraduate degrees and all of these things. And so I think there are models out there that work and uh, uh, the thing that's stopping us is lack of time maybe and, and maybe lack of, I, I wouldn't want to say ambition, but somehow um, it, 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 Universities are extraordinarily enabling places in principle that, that, that there isn't really anything stopping them doing what they want to do in that context. And so it's interesting that it doesn't happen as much as people seem to want it to happen. And I, I think we should be able to engineer that. Thanks. We have two more questions. I just, uh, we are arriving at the end of the event. So if someone wants to post a question after these two, we will take one, two more, no more, sorry. Um, we have Hugo Dino, which is one of our um, students in the MPP. So uh, Dino, please, can you unmute yourself? Unmuting, here we go. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Um, Christina already introduced me a bit. I found that uh, what our masters actually does pretty well is that they they accept quite a diverse uh, student cohort. So we come from a lot of different um, uh, backgrounds. And uh, when we do group work, we tend to lean quite heavily on the people who have expertise in the backgrounds. So I think it teaches us yeah. um, to use scientific based approaches or the expertise of people in different areas. Uh, so I thought that could be quite useful. Um, but my question specifically was um, about perhaps countries where this inclusive knowledge economy is done better or perhaps best. Um, and also something else that uh, I like to research on my own is this 
strong anti-intellectual, anti-expert sentiment um, that I that I found, uh, especially in the UK with Brexit, there was a big distrust in uh, in experts and their opinions. Um, so how could we um, address that uh, and make sort of the voices of experts uh, respected again? Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so I'm sure there are um, people on this call who are much better able than I to do the international comparisons. One, one thing that I've always been very interested about, though, in the context of um, the um, more natural sciences end of things, is that um, on the whole, the idea that it's um, not a kind of not for me thing, it's for it's for those kind of intellectual elite people over there. It's nothing to do. That attitude is quite a Western attitude and in developing countries there's much wider enthusiasm for research and innovation as a as an activity much wider and more straightforward enthusiasm for everybody to get involved in it and I at some level I wonder whether we aren't at some level a victim of our success in that um, we're in a society where um, the challenges of everyday life are somehow not so obviously connected with with technological solutions and that that's that you know began to drive the wedge about how relevant and important those things are for everyday life um and i i i'm, I'm sort of making that up <laughs> so I, I, and i'm sure there is wonderful research that that discusses this topic which i don't know about but i i have always been struck by those data that um there's less of a divide in developing countries in attitudes to to science than there is in in um, developed countries in terms of the the expert thing um I mean, most of the evidence I've seen says that at some level, whilst it was a, a sort of good political slogan, more it reflects the the divisions I talked about before about, you know, the communities who feel left out and left behind compared to those who feel really engaged in the kind of in, uh, international global um, culture that's moving very fast technologically. And it, it's an articulation of that rather than a genuine um, dislike for experts. And um, you know, I, I think that, that most of the data suggests that people have plenty of respect for experts. They, they they still go to the doctor when they're ill. They don't go to the you know then friend down the street um, because they do value that expertise. What people have been angry about is the the um, apparent lack of engagement and perception with the the challenges that they are facing and the, the difficulties that, that this, um, these big shifts in economy and society have, have created for some people whilst they've suited other people very well. And I, I think it's more a reflection of that divide than a genuine um, mistrust in genuine expertise. Thank you. Uh, Takahiro Fujita, another of our MPP candidates uh, from Japan. From Japan, sorry, Takahiro. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, uh, I wonder if uh, how can the government can attract more and more people with talents to be researchers and secure a broad base of science and technology in excessively strict government budget restraint, restraints. So, uh, in case of Japan. Uh, the government attempt, uh, try, uh, adapted uh, the selection and con concentration uh, to improve the efficacy and uh, efficiency in science funding. But as a result, uh, the support for PhD students and young researchers uh, who can't prove their uh, excellence by their achievements at that point uh, have been reduced uh, dramatically. And as a result, uh, a number of uh, students aiming to be researchers uh, gave up to be researchers. So. Uh, I wonder if uh, how uh, the government can justify such a uh, funding for uh, such a uh, young uh, young generation uh, and uh, secure the uh, amount of uh, uh, budget for uh, these uh, people. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I think uh, I mean the, the different countries will have slightly different priorities how they. Um, allocate their national budgets, but I think um, it's quite encouraging that despite the extraordinary. Um, extraordinary problems we have in, in the economy um, post-COVID, quite a lot of countries are choosing to prioritize 
uh, research and innovation investment because they see it as a, a, a really key way to rebuild the economy. So, um, so I, I think persuading funding out of governments is for this activity is not quite as, as, as challenging as one might imagine under the circumstances. I think a lot of your comments reflect rather the um, that kind of quite narrow view of what a career in research and innovation looks like that you go to university and you never leave. And I think we need to think about the training and the um, expertise and the skills that people um, build in, in research and innovation as they go through their formal education or um, as a path to many different types of, of career in research and innovation, just not necessarily in a university doing whatever it is you did before. And I, that works both ways. So as we talked about before, people who come um, up you know, who, whose lives build in different ways. So they haven't gone formally to university. They haven't um, done a PhD um, at this sort of normal, the normal, the average time because they've gone instead, you know, they started a company when they were 16. They, you know, gone through some kind of uh, um, alternative path and then later think they want to come um, into that um, perhaps more um, kind of narrowly focused research environment in, a, in an academic context. We need to find ways that that's also um, um, valued and supported. So I would say um, uh, the key really is giving, um, supporting a much wider range of perspectives about how you can take your research skills um, into a, a wide range of roles across the economy, rather than this notion that the only useful thing to do with your PhD is to stay there and keep hammering away at that particular subject. And um, I think that's a, uh, not a good way to think about a career in research, um, both in, in terms of, of you personally, because then you feel trapped and if it doesn't work, you feel rejected and, and miserable, but also in terms of the research system where that um, join up and movement of ideas, I think is, is, is crucial. But that, that is a hard, that's the harder thing to shift almost than the money out of government, because that's so embedded in the way we think about success in the academic context. And I think that's, that needs to change. Thank you. And I will take the last one. James Phillips, uh, please. Hi, I'm a neuroscientist who's briefly left science to, to work on some other things. Um, I'm curious, when I speak to young scientists, they're very worried that, that they're constrained in what they can work on by what will get into a luxury journal, which is sort of beneficial for for-profit publishers. So I'm curious what UKRI can do for sort of society journals, open access, preprints, more experimental models of publishing that could promote greater diversity. Absolutely. Hi, James. Good to not quite see you. Um, <laughs> so um, uh, I, I think that's absolutely right. I think um, the publication in particular journals is one of these um, uh, absurdly narrow criteria that doesn't even meet the objective that it's trying to, that has sprung up in the academic community and become heavily embedded by um, inappropriate feedbacks. And I think UKRI absolutely can contribute to breaking those feedbacks in a variety of ways. Uh, uh, absolutely in terms of um, the, the way we support um, open access policies as intelligently as possible. But I think actually more than that, I think it's more, it, it, we have to do more than just say, we don't mind where you publish your research as long as it looks like this. <laughs> we also have to say we value quite a range of different types of contribution and we certainly value this kind of contribution but we're also interested in um, you know the uh, the other things you've contributed more broadly to the system the people you've supported and helped to train or whatever if you're a junior researcher the tools you've developed and how you've made them freely available a, a, a wider range of things that that um, captures what we need across the system um, because we know that a system that consisted entirely of that sort of paper would be an incredibly flimsy and unrobust system um, because we would not have any of that underpinning stuff available and um, of use to the, the community more generally. So um, hugely important for funders and for universities and for research organizations more generally to shift the incentives such that the value that, that we value what we what we what the, everybody knows is important it's not even that it's rocket science to understand what we need but we need genuinely for our reward systems to to value all of those 
uh, contributions and for there to be clear opportunities to everybody to evidence those in a robust way, which there are these days. Thank you very much. I really think this is a very nice way to close this event. Uh, I am myself very happy that you make this remark, uh, Professor Leiser. Um, thank you very much for the inspiring talk. Thank you very much uh, to all the participants for the engaging discussion, for um, being here today with us. And I will pass over uh, Professor Mike Kenny to um, close the, the event. And thanks a lot again, uh, Professor Laser. Thank you. And just, just let me add my uh, thanks as well for that excellent talk, uh, Ottiline, uh, and also for the very thoughtful and open way you, you answered that range of questions that the audience put to you. Um, I guess I, I suspect I'm like others in the audience and now very interested to see how that agenda that you, you <laughs> described unfolds in the role you now have in the research system. Um, but I was, I have to say, very heartened to hear that your optimism is undimmed. That's, that's great. Um, but just as well as thanking Ottiline, um, I wanted to thank you all for tuning in and particularly to those of you who put questions and, and weren't cooking dinner, so I went on, on screen. Um, I just want to say that this is the final event in what's been a really busy calendar year for us at the Bennett Institute and Polis. Um, it's obviously been a pretty strange and challenging year in lots of ways. Um, if you'd like to know about the events that we're putting together for next year, please go to our website and uh, sign up for our newsletter. And I look forward to seeing you all again next year and maybe even in person. Good night.